Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the American Cetacean Society San Francisco Bay Chapters March of Speaker Event for 2023. I'm Susan Hopp, a board member in charge of our speaker program. And we're in for a really special afternoon um, and have really a very large audience, even though we're uh, we're diverging from our regular uh, Tuesday evening, second Tuesday of the month. So first, real quickly, for anyone new to the American Cetacean Society, we are a chapter within a national organization that is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins, porpoises, and their habitat. And we do this through education, community engagement, and awarding grants through uh, toward marine research. Uh, we really appreciate your donations because they allow us to do what we do. So um, thank you and, and thank you for being here. So we are recording this session and we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, the Q&A is actually better than the chat. And after the presentation, we'll do our, our best to get to all of them. So um, as you know, we're gathering on this Sunday morning for our special guest speaker, Tom Mustill, who is joining us from his home in London. And Tom is here to give us the personal journey through his very recent book, How to Speak Whale, A Voyage into the Future of Animal Communication. And after reading this beautiful, illuminating book of so much discovery, I couldn't be more thrilled that we have this live opportunity to hear from Tom. So let me introduce him. He is a biologist turned filmmaker and writer specializing in stories where people and nature meet. His work with David Attenborough, Greta Thunberg, Stephen Fry, and conservation and science heroes across the globe have won over 30 international awards, including two Webbies, a Wild Screen Panda, two Jackson Wild Awards, and been nominated for a Primetime Emmy. He directed on the blockbuster Inside Nature's Giant series, which won a British Academy Film and Television Arts Award, Royal Television Society and Broadcast Award, as well as the Zoological Society of London Award for Communicating Zoology. And although he loves any excuse to get into the sea, he lives far from it in London, as he says, uh, with his wife, Annie, and his daughter, Stella, and the inhabitants of his small but surprisingly deep pond. So with that, Tom, thank you so much for being here. and. Uh, I'll take it away. Thank you, Susan. Um, well, hello, everybody. Um, uh, it's it's lovely seeing all of the different uh, people saying where they're calling in from or watching from. Uh, I must admit, like, I'm slightly intimidating, but intimidated uh, because you all are very knowledgeable whale audience. But I'm also encouraged because you're already whale nuts. So uh, I won't have to persuade you how great cetaceans are uh, in any way. Um, I, uh, I I prepared a slightly new, a different talk than the one that I've been giving for a general audience since the book came out. Um, in the uh, because you, I'm going to assume that you know, already know quite a lot about uh, cetaceans. So I'm going to zip through. Oh wow, Argentina, that's great. Um, I'm going to zip through all of the kind of basic whale stuff, uh, and I'll try and and, and get through the, some of the. AI uh, bits, and I think the discussion in this particular community will be particularly interesting. So I'll, I'll try not to go on for too long. Um, so I'm now um, uh, going to just uh, share my screen and see if, uh, uh, like, uh, here we go. Do -do -do -do. And let's start this off. Do -do -do -do. Can you uh, can you see that uh, that I don't I um, it it flipped back and forth just once um, so now there whoops can you maybe, see it uh, no it's a black screen maybe um, oh okay one moment let me sorry let me oh, excuse me even though my book is about technology I'm so bad at this okay let's try again screen share I'll just do the whole desktop that's probably the easiest way of doing it. 
share. How's that? Yeah, looks good. Okay. So now you right. How's that? Can you see that? Beautiful. Great. Okay. Um, so today's talk is uh, uh, called How to Speak Whale, uh, because that's the title of the book I've written, but also because that's what I've been obsessed with for the last five years or so. Uh, it's, uh, and I think probably some of you will be aware of the backstory there. Um, and the presentation I'd like to give you today uh, will cover um, why, uh, and try and sort of set the scene for this extraordinary age that we're living on in, with uh, where advances in technology are really changing our relationship to the natural world. Um, I think we're all very familiar with some of the ways that technology is making our relationship with the natural world worse. Uh, and I, um, as somebody with a conservation background, very sensitive to this. But this is really about opportunities to make our relationship with the natural world better. Um, uh, so this is the book. Uh, here is uh, the, some of the covers. It's in 12 languages now, um, including both United States and British English. Um, and you can see some of them there. So they're quite interesting for me because they they show the diversity of human representations of really the same thing just across our different cultures. This is how Italians or Germans or Swedish or French uh, or US uh, or English people uh, would try and communicate about communicating about whales and dolphins. Um, oh, oh, my publishers should probably kill me if I didn't say, please buy it and buy it for your friends. And if you buy it uh, from the UK, I can sign them for you too. Anyway, uh, self-promotion over, let's get into the talk. So uh, a bit of background for me, I'm a conservationist. Here's me uh, in Mauritius when I first started out with an orphan uh, fruit bat, um, unoriginally called Batty. Uh, I was there working for Carl Jones, who's a sort of legendary conservationist, uh, famous for uh, saving the Mauritius kestrel, which at one stage was down to three individuals, one breeding female, uh, the echo parakeet, a pink pigeon, and lots of lizards and skinks. And he's really, it was amazing working with him. Um, I realized that I wasn't very cut out for field conservation because I got very lonely. My girlfriend dumped me and I wasn't very good at conserving the birds. Their numbers actually went down while I was working in this field station in Mauritius for six months. So I changed tack and felt that I would maybe be more helpful for conservation as a conservation communicator. Um, so since then, I've been making films. Uh, this is Rodrigo Medellin, uh, he, and one of the bats that he works with, the Lesser long Nose Bat, which is, uh, goes in a huge migration from south of Mexico City all the way up through the Nectar Corridor to the Sonoran Desert in the United States. And on its journey, it pollinates lots of plants, including the tequila uh, agave and mezcal agaves. So uh, a very important bat and a very important man. Um, and I've been fascinated uh, as well as by people, by gadgets. This is a wonderful kangaroo called Ella, um, who uh, was orphaned as a baby. And uh, she was found inside her dead mother's pouch by the side of a road um, and uh, by a guy who rescues red kangaroos. This is in the desert outside of Alice Springs. And he nursed her and acted as her mother, um, as he does for hundreds of kangaroos. Uh, most of them go back into the wild, but she was too habituated, so she lived in a sort of nature reserve, and she also loved carrots, and she loved carrots so much that if you offered her a carrot, she would eat it and allow you to film inside her pouch, and we were able to film with a prototype tiny little camera that didn't give off any heat, even though it had a light on it, and film the first ever birth and then development in, in the pouch of a joey. Here's a picture of that joey in the womb. I think this is about three weeks old. Uh, you can see its claws and its hind limbs are fully developed when it's first born. It's just its forelimbs and it's just a kind of snout. Um, uh, kangaroos are wonderful. They have three nipples, each of which secrete different milk sort of cocktails, a bit like a kind of soda bar. Um, so they can uh, feed the joey inside the pouch. But also if they've got a joey bouncing around outside, it can stick its neck in and feed from a different nipple and get a different cocktail of milk more suited for its particular stage of development. Um, uh, we've filmed uh, with lots of different people and doing conservation in lots of different places. This is a giraffe in Murchison Falls, Uganda, uh, that's, be, that's been tranquilized and had a hood put over its head. And now it's come round from the tranquilizer and it's being uh, sort of helped. It's, I mean, it's pretty full on process into the back of a, of a truck where it was driven um, to join other giraffes in the like the first successful translocation of Rothschild's giraffes across the Nile. They went in a boat across the Nile to establish a new population. Um, and uh, 
as well as working with really interesting people and uh, so animals, I've worked with really interesting people like here's Greta Thunberg. And uh, so I was having a sort of very interesting and lovely career. Um, and then it was sort of interrupted by events outside of my control. Um, oh, also, you might be familiar, this is Inside Nature's Giants. It's a documentary season uh, about uh, the workings of animals. I put this in here because uh, this was one of the first times I got really close to a cetacean. This was sadly a dead uh, cetacean. It was a sperm whale that beached on Pegwell Bay in Kent, which is on the south coast of the US. It's a beach where lots of whales uh, sadly wash up uh, or strand because it's got a very sh slow, sandy incline. Um, and so they seem to get quite disorientated there, a bit like the beach in Tasmania where, where lots of whales strand. Um, it was also chosen by Julius Caesar because of this low sandy escarpment to launch his triremes onto uh, for his invasion of England um, at the turn of, uh, well, zero, just about, I think it was two BC. I can't remember. I wasn't there. Obviously, I can't remember, but I can't remember when exactly it was. Um, so this was... Uh, 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 one of the times that I got to meet uh, one of your members and who you'll be very familiar with, uh, Professor Joy Reidenberg, an absolute gem of a human being. And this is uh, us trying to get inside the stomach of the whale to see what it died from. And I'll just hopefully this video will play. Very, very tough, very stiff blubber. It's coming up really well, though. It's really fresh. That's why in really really good shape this is actually the fat layer underneath the blubber this is not part of the blubber the blubber is actually this tough material here so there's blubber then fat then muscle this is connective tissue related to the muscles these very strong bands that hold it in place now there's huge tension on this it's about to come off that will weigh a massive amount as it pulls off. It's giving us access to both the thoracic cavity, the heart and the lungs underneath that, and the ribs. And at the back, the digestive system. That's gone. That's brilliant. Now we can actually get into the organs underneath. It's really exciting, but the time is marching on. It's really, really fresh. I don't smell anything. It's like, it's like walking down the butcher's aisle in the supermarket. All the meat's really fresh here. This animal, I think, is only around 24 hours dead. Uh, someone got a wipe. Get my face a wipe down around my lips. It's funny. The most dangerous thing is if you get it in your eyes or in your mouth. And so I know enough to keep my mouth shut. But... So, um... Uh, can I just check? Could you hear that, Susan? Yes. Fascinating. Great. Thank you okay. for sharing something like that, Tom. Wow. Oh, no. I mean, I'm sorry if you're just having your breakfast or lunch, wherever you are. But um, Joy is uh, is never perturbed. She's been, I think she's dissected over 100 cetaceans, uh, or maybe it was over 100 large whales and many more uncountable smaller cetaceans. Um, this was really to put in to, to talk about the past and our relationship with cetaceans. Obviously, um, we have a terrible history of commercial whaling, and uh, and but this uh, also was perhaps the only opportunity many people had for discovering anything about whales and dolphins. Uh, we couldn't really over, uh, observe their their lives in the wild, um, and so when they washed up and stranded, and then later when we industrially hunted and butchered them. These were really the only opportunities we got to understand anything about them and how they worked. And I had, was fortunate to meet uh, Malcolm Clark, who was uh, who died a few years ago, sadly, who actually went aboard some of the British whaling Antarctic fleet in the 1950s. And they, I think, quite disliked having a biologist on board. But in du uh, ducking out the way of all of the horrible slaughter, he was able to look at the whales as they came aboard and look at their stomach contents. And in his house, um, in uh, the Azores, where I visited him and his wife. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll nerd out on this a bit because you're well people. Um, his place was amazing. They, they, his wife and he had, as a retirement project, built a, a whale museum in their house that was full of unusual bones, uh, hundreds of jars of thousands of the beaks of squids that he'd collected from the stomachs of diving whales, like this, this sperm whale. 
Uh, he discovered actually that sperm whales eat giant squid and colossal squid and other, and in fact identified some new species of squid just from the stomach of sperm whales. Um, and his wife had painted all the walls with murals of the uh, the functional anatomy of the whales and from the ceiling hung life scale plush models that she'd sewn of the cetaceans and they would um, lie in bed and I went into their bedroom they showed me their bedroom and they had each had a pair of binoculars and they'd open the curtains at the end of their bed and they'd look out at the sea and they'd sit there well watching from bed and I just when I visited them I thought this is this is a dreamy retirement and it um uh, and so we have a lot to be thankful for from the brave biologists and anatomists who uh, did this really often very deeply unpleasant work. I've seen Joy like fully inside the body of a really quite decomposed and un, uh, whale. We would often be like dry heaving and she would just be um, totally un, unbothered. So anyway, a nod to Joy quickly. Um, but we are fortunately also now entering an age where we can discover things about whales and dolphins without them having to be dead. And that's what this talk is about today. So um, I should now talk about well, how I got involved in this. This is uh, a place that many of you will be familiar with. This is Moss Landing, um, uh, which is about halfway between the cities of Santa Cruz and Monterey. And this is me and my friend Charlotte. And uh, we'd been on holiday and I went to go visit Umbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, to see their underwater robots because I was really into any weird new robots. And the engineer, Brett, who showed me around, looked out the window and he said, there's loads of humpbacks out there. You should go kayaking. It's the best way to see them. So I signed up for a tour the next morning. I persuaded Charlotte, who's uh, a, an, an accountant and had never seen a whale before, to come with me. And you might notice if you look at the front of the kayak that it's an unusual shape uh, because this was taken after uh, what happened, um, which is this, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, but I'll play it anyway. This one, look at this one. He's huge. I think it's on. I got him. I got him on video. I got him on. He knocked it over. He knocked it over the kayak. Look at that. So yeah, um, these are some photos that were taken by Captain Mike Sack of Sanctuary Cruises as the whale jumped onto us. And this is us popping up afterwards, looking very happy not to be dead and also very confused about why we weren't dead. Uh, we weren't, had actually been, uh, I volunteered on whale watching boats as a kid. Oh. Um, uh, and uh, as my, my job was to keep people away from whales and I should add for anybody who, you know, is concerned about what we were doing that we were trying very hard to stay out of the whale's way and we actually had had an incredible morning um, had, and we're heading back to shore when the whale breached onto us. Um, but that actually there were so many whales at that time in Monterey Bay uh, that they stopped the kayaking afterwards after this happened. But I think they've started it again now, I'm not sure. But um, either way, uh, what, what happened from our perspective was that we were, uh, there were, I mean, I think we probably saw about 20 or 30 humpbacks. They were feeding on a big school of fish that had been there for weeks. Uh, they were feeding very uh, sort of relentlessly. It was absolutely extraordinary as a whale person, uh, even though I'd spent quite a lot of time around various cetaceans, I'd never seen anything like this aggregation. Uh, they were coming up all over the place. Um, there were some breaches on the horizon, and but mainly there was just constant feeding and the whales were in sort of groups of two or three. And I think many of you will be familiar with this. You'll have seen it yourself when they uh, they come up to the surface to breathe just between feeding bouts beneath the surface. Um, so yeah, we were heading back to the harbour and this adult humpback whale leapt out the sea. And the last thing I remember seeing was it just above us and I thought we're going to die. Um, and I threw my paddle away and turned over, which is, I guess, the kayak flipped over. I think I was just trying to run away while sitting down. Um, the next thing I remember I was, as well, the next thing I noticed I was underwater and I wasn't dead and I was moving around very quickly. Um, and I sort of felt that the whale was very close. 
I don't know how I knew this and maybe I was wrong, but I, there was lots of bubbles. I opened my eyes and it was all white. And then I swam back up to the surface. Um, I, I don't, I timed it on the video. We were down for about nine seconds and I we were quite deep. So I think the whale's body must have had, as it sucked down, pulled us with it a bit um, and popped up and I saw Charlotte and I was very confused because I thought she would be dead. Cause if you look at this freeze frame, she's in the front of the kayak and looking directly up at the whale as it comes down. Um, and uh, it's, it sort of uh, was arcing directly towards us and actually it's pectoral fin hit the nose of the kayak um, about a centimeter or two uh, ahead of her feet. Um, and we had a lot of questions afterwards, like how had we not died because the, uh, the trajectory of the whale um, was the last thing I saw was it was coming directly on top of us. And also, I, I don't know if you've ever tried to exit a kayak very quickly, but it's very, um, it's hard to wiggle out of it very fast. And I didn't understand how I didn't have like bruised knees or hips. Um, and my feet had been around the rudder pedals. Um, so I didn't understand how they got out. And I think probably it was the impact of the well on the top of it. Maybe the water, the, the air pressure through the hull pushed us out like sort of cork out of a bottle of champagne or something like that. Um, but I, I, I still find that very strange. I think, you know, a little section breaks between in the barriers the kind of membranes within the hull of the, the the kayak they were broken um and so i was left with a lot of questions about this and one was why uh, did this whale uh uh breach and i spoke to joy about it and she said that actually nobody knows why whale whales breach which you'll all know obviously there's lots of theories about it about you know dislodging barnacles or parrot skin parasites or communication but I thought this was kind of wonderful that this animal that's like three times the size of a T-Rex, you know, can expel as much energy. I think Ari and his team at UC Santa Cruz did an estimate and found it was something like 30 hand grenades worth of energy in this one movement. And we're still really quite in the dark about it. And I did, I really dove into whale biology and I, as well as the, the more astounding discoveries I found, the main feeling I came away with was how extraordinary, how little we know about them compared to land mammals. Uh, and that they do these giant impressive behaviors, the humpbacks and other cetaceans like singing and breaching. And we're not sure why, um, though we have lots of theories, but none of them are fully persuasive um, as far as I can see. Anyway, so, and the other thing they asked Joy was, um, why didn't we die? And she said that the whale actually turned in flight. It probably saw us and arced away. And she thought that when it was executing a breach, it wasn't doing a classic one. And so that's what happened that it, you can see here, the little lump of its eye sticking out and Peter Falcons, who's a well illustrator and I'm sure you're familiar with him. He lives up in San Francisco. He looked at it frame by frame and he frame and he reckoned the well stuck its eye out. They can actually move them around quite a fair bit and their lenses can move backwards and forwards so they can focus in water and in air and saw us. And so he felt that it did see us and turn away. And um, I found this very interesting. And I came to Monterey Bay and made a documentary for the BBC. Um, uh, obviously, like the, it begs the question, like, did the whale care in any way about us? And I think the jury is really out on that. I think it might be a bit optimistic to think the whale was trying to do anything other than not land on the uncomfortable looking new object it hadn't thought would be underneath it when it breached. But then when I was in Monterey Bay, I did witness humpbacks coming in. Um, uh, and I think a lot of people were out that day, including Jody Frediani, who might be here today. Um, and saw humpbacks dislodging uh, a pod of killer whales of orcas from uh, feeding on a gray whale calf that they killed. And obviously, like Robert Pittman and others have uh, found that humpbacks engage in these altruistic behaviors coming to the aid of other species, as well as other humpbacks. And they've done it over 100 occasions around the world. And it seems to be like quite a common behavior in humpbacks and maybe other cetaceans to interfere and look after other species and they do i mean I'm, i think you've seen it probably among your members there's some really good photos taken of uh whales raising other animals out of the water seemingly out of harm's way um so did this whale care about us who knows but you know whales do seem to care about some other species sometimes um uh and uh, so i came to uh oh one sec oh yeah this is the bit uh, where i'm going to skip zoom through because you know lots about this but there's 90 um odd species of cetaceans uh, ranging from little small dog sized ones uh, to gigantic uh, 30 meter sized ones like the blue whale. Um, they are mammals, as you all know, and they uh, used to live on land. 
And because they used to live on land, they have lots of things in common with us, uh, as well as our shared mammalian heritage. They have um, warm blood, they have uh, whiskers from uh, in their faces. Uh, in fact, as the well came down and landed on us, uh, the thing I really remember noticing was how bumpy the tubercles, the, the lumps on the, its face were. I remember like really distinctly thinking, ah, tubercles um, and uh, its ventral pleats, because uh, freed from their life on the land uh, and freed from gravity, they, some of them have been able to grow enormously big. And then some of them swapped out their teeth uh, for baleen plates, which allowed them to, instead of hunting uh, individual prey, to hunting hundreds, if not thousands of prey, in the case of like krill, uh, at once by gulping big amounts of seawater and filtering it out. Anyway, you all know all of that, but there's loads of different cetaceans and they live in almost uh, every uh, body of uh, mar marine water and some fresh around the world. Um, and here is an example of the uh of this of this whale heritage this is the uh uh four like it's the hand uh and this used to be it's uh, obviously about 50, 55 million years ago when whales lived on land these were the hands they walked on the four um, four limbs and inside their pet their uh pectoral fins this is what you'll find inside articulated um hands very similar to our own and in some uh, whales you'll also find their hind limbs their back legs uh, hidden away within their blubber, um, another echo of their land origin and our shared origin. We walked alongside each other on land a while ago. Um, and if you look inside their heads, you will find really unusual brains. This is Professor Patrick Hoff at Mount Sinai, a coll colleague of Joy Reidenberg. And I went to visit them as they MRI'd and CT scanned the brains of uh, two whales, a sperm whale baby uh, and a, a minke whale, uh, a very young minke whale. Um, their brains share a lot of things in common with us, um, including their large size. The sperm whales is the biggest of all animals potentially ever. Um, they uh, have lots of convolutions. They've got lots of gray matter. Uh, basically, the more wrinkly and, compli and complicated and joined up a brain is, uh, the more advanced cognition it's thought to be able to do. Um, they have lots of similarities with our brains, which make us think that maybe they're really clever like us. Um, but it's very hard to compare con cognition even among people. We have no really good measure of human intelligence, but uh, they have neurons that we use uh, that we think are to do with empathy and complex linking of different brain structures, kind of high speed neurons that link different uh, functional areas of the brain. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear my young daughter. She's making some well uh, noises in the background here. Okay, good. <laughs> it's, it's her bath time. She's a, a pretty much a semi-marine mammal. Um, anyway, their brains are incredible. Uh, and they've also like got really interesting things like uh, they've got a thickened corpus callosum, which is the bit that joins the two hemispheres of your brain. One theory about this is perhaps it allows them to do a really impressive thing they do, which is to put half their brain asleep uh, while the other one is awake. Uh, hemispheric sleep because you need in the sea to keep vigilant and an eye open for predators and swimming back to the surface and able to open your blowhole and inhale and close it again. Um, and so uh, their brains are very similar in that they're, they're big and they're complex and they have similar structures, but they're also very different. So how do they perceive the world? How do they think? What is it like to be a whale? We don't know, but uh, they are definitely not big, stupid fish, as many humans have thought them to be for a very long time. Also, when I say whale, I'm just using it as a shorthand for whales, dolphins and porpoises. Forgive me. Um, it's a bad personal habit, but um, I can't. I, since I wrote a book called How to Speak Whale, I, 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 I can't just stop saying whale. And obviously, with many of these discoveries about whales and dolphins and porpoises, what we discover in one of them might not apply to other ones. Um, so uh, this is some beautiful footage from Howard Hall um, of humpback whales. These are in a heat run. I think this is in Tonga. Um, we've uh, uh, learned a lot about whales since the uh, 1950s. We've learned, uh, well, uh, cetaceans, that is, uh, we've lit, uh, as well as them not being really, really stupid. We've learned that they're, they could be highly social, that they have a variety of different adaptations for, for living in the various places. Um, but that, that, that for among the social species, sound seems to be of utmost importance. They have really, really good hearing. The, uh, as well as having very good ways of listening in, uh, anat anatomically, they've got um, a mechanism where they can conduct sound through their jaws and in their uh, ear uh, bulbs, they have uh, loads and loads of nerve endings and uh, the parts of their brains associated with hearing uh, are very well, well developed, similar to the way that the parts associated with vision are very developed in ours. Um, they uh, 
uh, also have incredible virtual so voices the tooth whales many of them can actually make two sounds at the same time they can sort of sing duets with themselves like some songbirds can uh, that's not the case of the baleen whales uh, but they make use uh, in their various habitats and their various bodies of a huge register of uh, acoustically from way below human hearing and infrasound through the acoustic spectrum that we can listen to and up above in uh, uh, the, the spectrum above we can hear uh, and in ultrasound so we uh, and uh, humpback whales are great examples of that uh, with their singing which is one of the vocal thick ways that they well, one of the ways they vocalize and the most famous um, and it makes sense obviously to uh, use a lot of use sound very in the sea because you can't see because there's no light in when, once it gets deep or once there's loads of uh, stuff in the water uh, and uh, sound travels really nice and quickly in the water so it's much more effective in the sea than to communicate on in, in the air it travels four and a half times faster so they've got big brains a variety of bodies that are really well adapted for a variety of habitats uh, they have great hearing they have great voices um, and they and we've noticed that they vocalize in lots and lots of different ways and the more we listen the more complex these vocalizations seem so these are great ingredients for an animal that might be having some sort of con uh, conversation. They also seem to be very interested in other species, which is unusual. Uh, sometimes they're even interested in us. And I'm sure people on this call have experienced friendly whales that come to check them out and sit their heads out of the water and look at them. Um, they uh, have interspecific friendships and associations among the cetaceans. You have, uh, 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 I, I don't know if you guys saw in Blue Planet 2, I think, was it Bottle was it false killer whales and bottlenose dolphins? I can't remember the two species, but there are lots of uh, associations between different cetacean species. And that so they are curious, they are playful, they make friendships outside of their own species and they're highly social within their own species or many of their own species, not all of them too. Um, so those are other great ingredients with an animal that you might want to have a, com a conversation with. They are sometimes interested in us and they sometimes already seem to interact across the species boundaries. Uh, as well as having all the anatomical and social uh, and evolutionary pressures that might make being a conversationalist take place in the sea. Um, and uh, they are as weird as us too. Uh, this is a photo by Dan Bianchetta with Monterey Bay Whale Watch of a killer whale uh, orca with a mola mola on its head. Um, forgive me if I say killer whale, I don't think they take it personally. I think maybe some of them are quite into being really good at killing and eating things. Um, uh, this seemed to be, uh, uh, a, there was no real explanation for why these killer whales were doing this, um, but about 30 odd years before in the Pacific Northwest, further north, there was a population of whales where one of the females in the pods started wearing salmon as hats. And then as a craze, this spread among all the other whales in her pod. And for a few months, they all wore salmon as hats and then they stopped. And there's no great explanation for this other than they liked it. There didn't seem to be a functional adaptation. It just seemed to be something that they dug. And I love this because I think these inexplicable, inexplicable kind of whale crazes uh, are sort of portals into the idea that there could be societies and cultures in the sea. They've been in the sea talking to each other for a lot longer than we've been on the land talking to each other. And vocal cultures are very resilient, as we know from human vocal cultures, which actually have been found to ha um, accurately transmit information about, say, the coastlines of Australia and Northern Europe. Uh, in indigenous populations in those two places um, for over 10,000 years. Like in the stories of the people who still live in those places, they could, they describe where the coasts were in the last ice age. So imagine what whale cultures might be talking about. Uh, and in the same way that we have weird crazes that no one can explain, like crazy frog. I don't know if that happened in the States. That was a ringtone that was very popular in the UK. Um, there seems to be a population of orca uh, off Gibraltar that's disabling fishing vessels by ramming and smashing up their uh, rudders and they've done it to uh, over a hundred small boats so many that the Spanish authorities have told the boats not to go there why they're doing it nobody knows um, and there's a bunch of weird stuff that whales and dolphins do all over the world and I think often biologists uh, or most humans would just look for the why why are they doing this what's the functional adaptation to look at it you know through the light of evolution which is a really good approach to trying to understand why other animals behave in the way they do but I have a pet theory that in the sea, some of these species are really good at living and surviving. And that if you have spent a lot of your time surviving and you've managed to forage and mate and reproduce and you find yourself with spare time, as humans we do sometimes on land, maybe indulging in crazes and weird uh, group behaviours and uh, ex artistic expression and having fun is, is what they do too. We know that dolphins 
um, like to pass like the old puffer fish around occasionally to get a bit high off it. Uh, they bow ride, they uh, do all sorts of other things that don't seem to have a great explanation if placed in the um, terms of just practicing for the hard business of staying alive. Um, uh, and we also already have a history of interacting with cetaceans and teaming up with them. This is a photo from Eden, which is a small town uh, in uh, what is called by uh, it, in the ancestral lands of the Yuin Nation in southeast uh, Australia. Um, it's uh, on the migratory corridor of some baleen wells that go up that coast, and there has been for a very long time there orca off that coast, killer whales who hunt those migrating baleen whales. Um, we know they've been there for a long time because the warriors outfits there have black and white markings very similar to the whales and there are cave and rock uh, art that depict the whales there and in the vocal culture of the people there, um, the whales are respected as ancestors and uh, described as members of the extended family and there are many stories about them. Um, the If you notice that in this picture, this is a whaling boat operated by a family of Scottish whalers, but these are not all Scottish people. These uh, Some of these people are indigenous Australian people who were hired by the Davidson family. And they taught the Davidson family, um, this photo was taken around the turn of the century, that you could team up to hunt the baleen whales with the killer whales. Um, they, uh, you can see there's a small whale between the big dorsal fin of the killer whale there. That's the calf of the whale that the killer whale and the men are hunting together. Um, that's uh, to the right hand side of this image. Um, over, I think, four generations, this family teamed up to hunt with the resident orcas here. They would go out, the orca would sit off the coast and uh, wait for the baleen whales coming through. Then they would, they would trap them and send orca to the coast to get the whalers, who would then lead the whalers out in their boat to the baleen whale. They, the killer whales didn't do this with all the humans, whalers, just the ones who'd been taught how to do this by the uh, indigenous Australian uh, crew members. Their boat had distinctive green underside and the killer whales made an association with those boats and not the ones of the other whalers who lived there. Um, when they got out to the uh, baleen whales, they would harpoon them. And sometimes the killer whales would even pull on the ropes from the harpoons. Uh, there is uh, skulls of those whales in the museum there in Eden, which have the groove marks or other damage done by pulling on the ropes. And, um, uh, or at least that's what's said, where the damage comes from. And uh, this happened for multiple generations and it was captured in diaries and photographs and paintings. Um, I think it was over 50 years at least it took place uh, until sort of the 1910s, 1920s, when sadly uh, new whalers coming in from Norway killed the killer whales. Um, and, uh, but there's, there's a longer part of this story, uh, which I go into much more detail in the book, um, which is fully referenced because, which I, I really recommend getting into because some of the references and the stories that uh, where these come, uh, come from uh, are absolutely mind blowing. I didn't have the chance of going really, really deeply in the book into them. But one particularly poignant story was, uh, one of the whalers uh, drowned from the Davidsons and they looked for his body for a long time um, and they couldn't find it. And they noticed that old Tom, who was one of the whales, there's a big male whale, in fact, the last of the whole pod to, when it eventually died out, was spending a lot of time in one side of the bay. And um, eventually after three days, they went over to where old Tom was spending his time and they found the body of the, of the whaler uh, under the surface there who drowned. And this is very interesting in the light of the idea that maybe cetaceans could ex experience grief or mourning. Um, uh, obviously, there are cases of uh, uh, killer whales carrying their deceased calves around for days, sometimes weeks after they've died, losing body condition, acting differently, exhibiting signs of what biologists might consider to be some sort of mourning behavior. So if, uh, and if whales and dolphins can make friends across the species boundaries, if that sometimes happens with humans and they can experience grief or mourning for their own kind, perhaps this whale was experiencing something similar for its dead human friend. Um, a really interesting question. Um, um, but uh, we, uh, and I'll now get into the sort of, uh, uh, part of the talk about uh, where, we're, where we're at now and how technology is changing these, these conversations. So there's been a lot of speculation about, you know, these animals live for a long time. You know, bowhead whales can live for over 200 years. They're highly social. There's lots of them. They speak in, or maybe they communicate in 
lots of complex different ways and they're really good and they have really effective strategies that they are held together by those communications i won't go into detail i'm sure you're familiar with discoveries of things like signature whistles which are analogous to names for some dolphin species um, or that sperm whales are sorted into acoustic clans where even if two populations are, look identical um, they actually and they live in the same home waters they might actually act totally differently and not talk really interact with, vocally with each other um, and the idea uh, from people at Hal Whitehead and other sperm whale researchers is that these are different cultures and that the way that they speak is so important to them. Uh, they have different accents and dialects that perhaps they can't uh, understand each other, but they certainly so they, they teach each other how to live in very different ways, how to hunt in different ways, how to defend themselves in different ways, how to forage and cooperate. Um, so they are communicating with these uh, different uh, I guess we don't know if they're accents or dialects or something akin to language, these communication systems um, in really different ways and that they're transmitting different cultures in the sea. But how could we find out what these cultures might be? How could we find out if there's any meaning, if there is meaning that we could understand in their communications? We have been really stuck with a big problem, which is that we're humans. And this human problem uh, has two facets. One is that we are land animals and it's very hard for us to go out in the sea and follow whales around and, and watch them and listen to them. Um, if you want to understand another potential language, you need to listen to a lot of it and you need to have a context for it. You need to see how it's used. You need to perhaps try and learn it yourself. How do we do that with whales and dolphins? Where it's really lucky if you just see a dorsal fin occasionally or one of them breathing. Imagine being an anthropologist sent to study a tribe of people that had just been made contact with, but you were only allowed to notice them when they inhaled or exhaled. It's really hard. And that's when the sea is nice and you've got a boat and the captain is sober and uh, you've got all your machines and you've charged all the batteries and everything. So, and the other part of being human that makes it really hard to understand maybe what whales and dolphins are saying is that we are convinced that we're the only people who are talkers. So we really hold ourselves in very high esteem. We think that, uh, or for a long time, we think that we uh, were the only animals that had like self-consciousness, that we felt in deeper and more profound ways and that we thought in deeper and more profound ways than other species. We just don't know if that's true because we have no way really of measuring our own intelligence. And it feels like a big leap. And a lot of the decisions about what made humans special and what we could do and other animals couldn't do have been, seemed to be made by um, people who don't spend much time studying animals like philosophers um, and uh, linguists who I particularly in the five years of research this book have found tiresome. I must add uh, they constantly argue about what language is, they change the definitions of it and the ones who seem to know for certain that other animals don't have something like language seem to be the ones who spent the least time watching other animals. As a scientist I think that seems like a weird speculation to make. And I think there's something in human nature that is deeply troubled by the idea that other species might communicate in complex ways like language. Um, anyway, so those two things, uh, the problem of being a person and having our preconceptions and being a person and being really bad at following whales around and listening to them are not shared by machines. So recently we've been able to translate, uh, transcend our human um, sort of limitations with the help of machines. So here's a video of a blue whale with a, a, um, a tag being attached to it from a drone. This is from Ocean Alliance. So here you have a drone flying above a whale and not disturbing it as much as a boat potentially driving up to it and dropping a tag. Uh, and on the tag, uh, which is fitted by a suction cup, uh, it uh, is a camera and a microphone and a depth gauge and an accelerometer and a thermometer. Um, that tag is waterproof and it has all of those things because of these things, because we've been carrying cell phones around with us and we've been trying to make their batteries last longer, make them still work if you drop them in the lavatory um, and uh, put GPS signals on them so you can share your location with your partner as you're late for dinner and uh, a uh, thermometer to tell you what to wear and all these other useful human things they're very very useful for uh, as scientific monitoring devices and essentially the miniaturization of uh, tools that humans use for recording and monitoring and sharing our lives are now being used by biologists um, and uh, we're starting to be able to li uh, listen in and watch in to the lives of cetaceans in like far more detail than we were able to previously um, Here's another example. Here's a GPS tag on a, I think it was a blue whale. This is not Chile. Um, and 
you can see uh, as this uh, video plays, uh, the red, the blue dot is the blue whale, and the red dots are boat traffic. And so, with these uh, like uh, technological tools, as well as watching what their lives are like, we can also see how they respond to the ways that we change their environments. And I think a really good point to me uh, that was made by I'm trying to remember who told me this, but um, that we we're studying animals in distress. Uh, if if a bowhead whale can live for two hundred years, the, and uh, then a whale alive now could have lived through the ages of, of sail, steam, diesel, and nuclear, um, and witnessed the decimation and total change of the oceans it lived in within a generation. This isn't an evolvable period of time. Um, if 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 this these kind of changes happen to humans on land, if this like if the blue whale populations that had over ninety nine percent of their individuals slaughtered, the seas suddenly ringing with sounds where previously they were quiet, um, massive big metal things smashing above them, the fish changing, the waters warming and acidifying, we're we're the conversations that we're listening to in the sea and the behaviors we're witnessing are not the natural behaviors of these animals. Um, and I think that's really worth bearing in mind when we think about what we're listening into in their communications and what kind of cultures we're witnessing. And I think a lot of biologists are also seeing changes in what the whales are doing since the moratorium and whaling and some populations have bounced back. Um, and here is, this is uh, from Jupiter Research, this is a wave glider, this is really cool. This is a solar and wave powered um, uh, sea robot that, that actually can pilot itself. I went to visit them in Hawaii where they make them and they just had one back that had uh, it had sailed itself from Hawaii to Baja um, uh, without human instruction, avoiding boats using its own systems and uh, powering itself and listening the entire time. So this is one in quite high, high seas. So obviously when the seas are really rough, lots of scientists have to go home because it's dangerous. But this wave glider chugs along happily a couple of knots an hour um, and underneath it is dangling uh, things like uh, uh, like hydrophones, the underwater microphones that can listen constantly, recording constantly. They've got a little video camera, uh, pho sorry, photographing camera on the deck. Apparently, sometimes passing sailors expose themselves to these cameras, which is quite a funny problem to have. Um, and uh, they get seagulls landing on them, um, and uh, uh, they can listen, and they can also monitor for other things like ocean acidity and these. And so we have. Uh, robots driving around the sea listening out for whales we can listen to them from their own backs um we can track them from space um we're even devising th this is a soft robotic fish made by uh, mit um that uh, here it is being sort of uh, tested over a reef uh, we can uh devise uh devices that uh, can swim among uh, the living inhabitants of our oceans. And as these become more sophisticated, perhaps they won't notice and mind quite so much as they probably would if they saw a bloke knit with a weird robot fish, but um, and do quite natural things. So we'd be able to listen in uh, to uh, their undisturbed behaviors and lives. Um, and uh, a, bit, a big problem with all of these devices is suddenly we are uh, stuck with huge volumes of data. Uh, a lot of the, I went to the bioacoustics conference, the IBAC, the annual bio, uh, uh, gathering of people who listen in to the sounds that other animals make. And the co the constant problem that they all seem to have had changed from we can't record anything to we have too much recordings. How do we find our way through it? I think probably all of us have experienced this in our lives as we went from maybe being the first person to have a digital camera among our friends to suddenly not knowing where to store all the photographs that we're all taking all the time on our cameras. And we and so this is where data management comes into biology because um, we are gathering uh, vast amounts of data more than humans can look through and listen through. So again, we uh, help, we can get help from machines. Um, and I just like to mention, this is Project SETI, um, which I go into detail about in the book. This is one of a bunch of um, biological expeditions and uh, ventures that are trying to make as much use as possible of artificial intelligence. Um, uh, AI has been in the news a lot recently for correctly terrifying reasons. Uh, there are branches of these um, uh, machine learning tools where we are making our own jobs redundant. 
uh, by training them to do the things that we do better and faster than us. Uh, there are fears that we might make give them in powers over ourselves and make ourselves extinct. These are very important conversations. Um, but I, not uh, but that's not what I'm going to go into today. What I'm talking about today is how AI is being used as a way of sifting uh, vast amounts of information and helping us find patterns in it. Uh, but one way of thinking about a biologist is, a, is somebody who finds patterns in nature. And a lot of these deep learning neural networks, which are the algorithms used by uh, biologists, um, essentially find patterns in the data we've recorded of living systems. And I think what, what's going on now is we're changing. Um, uh, oh, no, I'll get to that bit in a bit. Anyway, so what you can see in this diagram is some sperm whales. And um, off Dominica, uh, right now, the biggest ever animal behavior exercise, uh, recording exercise is taking place. Um, there's over 40 biologists uh, on multiple continents and lots of institutions. And they are... Drop, uh, they've got hydrophones and static arrays in the sea. They're putting tags that can record uh, multi-directional. I, I hung out with Michael Bronstein, who's the DeepMind professor of AI at Oxford University, and he showed me some of the first uh, recordings they're getting back off the tags on the whales. They're breaking records for how long a suction like tag can stay on a whale, so not actually disturb it, um, but stay, but not get dislodged because you want to be recording for a long time. And they've got multi-directional microphones on them, so you don't have to put one on each whale in a pod to know who's talking because with multi-directional microphones you can do a software analysis that tells you and separates out the voices for you which is really important if you want to try and uh like record a conversation um and they are going to be recording for years and years and years in the home territory of the uh sperm whales that live there uh, they're going to record uh lots of other things like the weather what the whales are uh, what the whales are doing who the whales are who are talking or rather communicating um they're going to eavesdrop as baby whales learn to communicate. Um, and then uh, they are going to use uh, artificial intelligence tools, which are pattern recognizing tools, and they're going to use them in various different ways. Um, one of the ways they're going to use them is just to get through some of the drudgery of this field work. They're going to ask them to look through all the data and say, when are whales communicating? Then they're going to say, uh, or rather, where, where are their whale noises? They're going to say, when are those coders, which are the communicative parts of the sperm whale vocalizations, and when are they echolocation clicks? And then they're going to say, uh, use them to say, okay, well, what kind of coders are they here? Are they the ones used by this clan or this clan? Um, but uh, and so that's just sort of helping biologists do the traditional ways that they've been that we've tried to. I'm well, not a biologist, sorry, but uh, biologists have tried to. Um, find patterns in the communications of other species. But the really exciting thing and the important thing that's going on here, and I think is going to be happening in multiple domains in the sea and in land in the study of nature, is that the re they're getting big data. And big data really here means um, data sets, orders and orders of magnitude bigger than biologists have ever ga gathered before. Data sets that are intentionally bigger than any human could listen through and look through in multiple lifetimes, because what we found uh, in human communication analysis is that if you have enormous data sets, um, you can apply pattern finding tools that uh, find invisible patterns in human languages. Uh, Google Translate works using, um, uh, in fact, I'll show you now, this is um, uh, what's called an embedding. So this is uh, this is uh, from the Earth Species Project, this visualization. This is, I think, the top uh, 10,000 or 100,000 words in English. Um, the reason the, they're arranged into this is a 3D representation for us, but really in the uh, software, it's represented, it can be in thousands of dimensions. Um, each dot represents a word here, but it can represent other features of language. And they there have been a couple of breakthroughs in the analysis of human language by computers that have been really, really fascinating. Um, you might have been seeing what ChatGPT and Bing and other uh, language models are able to do in terms of uh, analyze human commands, uh, find patterns in human uh, information, and then write things back to us. And we can go and then the I mean the ethics side of this is like extraordinary and very very important and I think we can go into that in the chat um but I'll, but the first thing that was discovered was that you can kind of do geometry on language if you place uh, all the words in thousands millions of conversations or other features into uh into these uh, if you plot them uh and the gaps are uh 
between them and the angles of those gaps are related to how often those words are used and what other words they're associated with, you can sort of make a galaxy of, of, of all the relationships um, commonly in a language between the elements of that language. And it will form these giant kind of galaxy um, uh, shapes. The big, um, and you can kind of do some sort of uh, maths on these things. You can do geometry on them and you can actually deduce uh, what one word is based on its position relative to another. But what was absolutely fascinating about this was the, the discovery that you can use this to translate between languages because the galaxy shapes of English and the galaxy shapes of Urdu have similar patterns within them. These are patterns that we can't perceive ourselves. We have to learn and be taught languages. But the deep learning neural networks that were given um, data sets of English and Spanish and French and all of our different languages is were, were found to be able to translate between human languages just using these patterns they found. They were not taught how to translate. They weren't even taught that they were looking at a language. They just saw patterns that are deep within huge amounts of data uh, of our languages, and that is how Google Translate works. It translates without a dictionary. And obviously, if you have a tool that can find patterns hidden within languages that doesn't need to be taught how to translate between them, that's really exciting if you were trying to find patterns in the languages of other species where obviously no dictionary exists. And perhaps our brains aren't even competent uh, to perceive these patterns, even if we're listening and seeing them directly in front of us. So that's why this project, SETI and other projects, are attempting to gather these huge data sets. They want to run analyses using these tools developed on humans to see what patterns in, uh, they can find. And they have some big aims that they want to, the linguists on the teams, once these patterns have had their attention drawn to them, want to then do chatbots. They want to kind of run uh, tests essentially on what they think the conversations between these whales might be. And you can, what's interesting is because they'll be recording constantly, they can have a bunch of competing theories about this, and then they can say, okay, well, if this theory is right, what are the whales doing next? What did they say next? And they can test them, and they can keep testing them and refining them. Um, and their goal is to have the first two-way conversation with a whale. I think it was in 2026, but that's been pushed back a little bit. But um, since uh, I've published the book, we now have the ability to... Um, deep fake lots of human things we also have the ability to deep fake whales we can make representations of the sounds they make of novel sounds that i think to the ears of a whale would probably sound like another whale speaking we don't yet know what those sounds we can deep fake are and that's really scary because um I, and i think the people on project seti that i've been speaking to are very aware of the ethics side of this of how long we need to listen before we communicate back if we do decide to do that and how we do that. But that's a huge discussion because I think in the process of writing the book, I just wanted to say, hey, look, these AI tools that we develop for people, these machines we develop for watching ourselves and these tools we've used for finding patterns in them are now being used for biologists. What does that mean? What does that mean for nature? And here is why these biologists are doing it. Um, this is the cover of Science Magazine from 1971. And these are the songs of humpback whales represented uh, visually um on the cover this was the famous paper by roger payne and scott mcveigh um roger payne is one of the principal scientists in project seti um i spoke to him last week uh he's 88 it's over 50 years now since the discovery that humpback whales sing and this paper and their inclusion in the famous national geographic magazine flexi disc and then with his friend carl sagan where they were put onto the golden discs that were shot into space on the Voyager space probes, now the furthest objects that are made by humans from the Earth. Um, Roger discovered, along with Scott McVeigh and help from Katie Payne, his wife, and others, that whales sing. Um, and uh, because of Roger and other people, these uh, this scientific discovery was made, but also uh, this was a huge change in human culture. At this point, we were industrially slaughtering whales. Uh, the sci-fi author Arthur C. Clarke wrote, we do not know the true entity of the, uh, the true nature of the entity we are destroying. But because we thought they were stupid, because we thought they were different, we, we industrially slaughtered them. When we learned that they sang, this was one of the most important factors in the decision of humans to change. Uh, it was crucial in the founding of Greenpeace and the Save the Whales movement. Um, listening to whale songs and hearing patterns in the vocalizations they made that we could relate to our own lives made us care about them. We knew we were killing them in vast numbers before, 
that didn't change but we thought we, when we realized that they sang like us we cared more and this is why it's so important what these biologists are doing with project seti i believe because we are still in a very bad place in our relationship with the natural world um and we need empathy tools that's why i make films as a biologist because they're empathy tools they're ways of helping humans from seeing patterns we recognize in the lives of other species and in seeing those patterns help us care more about them enough to inconvenience ourselves to change our behaviors in ways that would help them too and i think it um understanding the communications of other species um will be a profound moment for humans in the way that we relate and live on this planet i think akin to the photographs of the earth taken from space that showed us as a pale blue dot when we realized our vulnerability um, in space and our specialness um and there are people that will find this upsetting as there were people who found it upsetting when we discovered that the uh, earth was not the center of the universe and people were burnt at the stake because of this and people got very grumpy but no one today cares that we're not the center of the universe because it's true and we all learned it but human culture we hold on to our own pasts <laughs> excuse me so that's kind of why how it all works and why they're doing it i gave a lecture recently for the turing center this is alan turing the father of computing mm. or so he's called he gave a lecture about machine uh, intelligence and he used this phrase machines take me by surprise with great frequency um i am even though uh this book only came out last year i have been taken by surprise by the frequency of change in this domain and field i don't know if you guys are on marmam the marine mammal uh, email list i have just seen the number of um uh papers that use machine learning and other and other machine tools uh discovering huge numbers of new things about cetaceans drones watching the behaviors of male bottlenose dolphins uh passive acoustic monitoring these big like listening systems on the seafloor that record huge amounts of data um using uh, ais to find uh pat like to notice which whales are there and when they are there <laughs> it's a really crazy time um and i know this personally because and the reason that um i got into this whole journey was that ai was used to identify the whale that breached on me um i came to monterey bay and these are some of the amazing humans that i uh, got to spend time with now uh, you can see joy there there's ted uh, cheeseman on the right there um among many others uh ted uh runs happy whale which many of your members will be familiar with uh, happy whale had just started a couple of weeks before the whale brunch breached onto me in charlotte um just at the end of the shoot uh the film shoot when i came and made a documentary for the bbc and pbs about con whale conservation in monterey bay it's called the whale detective you can see it on pbs it's still up there um ted id'd the whale that leapt onto us and he did it um uh by its tail fluke which is how uh, actually it was a mixture of its pectoral fin underside and its tail fluke but he did it because um of this this graph this is the, the percentage of the world population that has a cell phone and uh you can see it rising rapidly the whale let breached onto us in 2015 um almost everybody we know carries a scientific monitoring device in in their pocket that can take photographs and upload them to the internet where they can be shared and videos and that's what happened somebody filmed that whale as it breached onto us other people took photographs of it they shared them on the internet that's how they can analyze its behavior and that on Happy Whale, which is a whale photograph sharing website that's a citizen science uh, program uh, where you can link the tail fluke photographs you've taken and identifications with other people's. And so instead of just having an isolated ID, you can fit what you've seen of the life of that animal into its life story because of all the other humans out there with their machines sharing that information. So Ted was able to not only ID the whale, but link it to other sightings. <laughs> Um, so we knew how old it was, where it was born, who its mother was, and follow its life ever since. And that was astonishing to me. And that's why I started looking into it, because I thought if I can start learning more about this random incident that happened to me, what does this mean for other people and the rest of a relationship with other animals? Because you can buy a crowdsourced AI powered uh, bird feeder that identifies the birds that come and feed at your house. 
At the moment, it just does it by species. I have no doubt soon it will do it by individual birds because they all are individuals and they differ. It won't take much to train the uh, algorithms to discern the difference between individual birds. This is how you build an, 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 a relationship, is when you see, instead of others as being a block, you see them as individuals. I think you saw this yourself with the extremely sad death of Fran, the humpback whale that died um, off the coast of California last year. Um, I, I, I came out whale watching in California and I saw um, people who went out, there was a man who'd been going out to see Fran and he'd gone out on over a hundred trips and he, just wanted to see this particular whale. He had a particular affinity for it. Um, when uh, Fran uh, migrated, people were anxious to see her again. When she finally turned up with the calf, people were excited. When she was killed by a boat, people were really upset. And people got together and they demanded from their legislators that more protections for these animals. These relationships between individual animals and humans really matter, and these machines are helping us have them. Um, my own story is developing. Um, this is something I'm really excited to share with you. I've just got this email uh, just this weekend um, from uh, Daniel Palacios, who's a biologist in Mexico. Um, he was using, a, like a month ago, a prototype uh, instant whale ID tool that Ted Cheeseman and Happy Whale developed that meant that you could identify the whales right in front of you, of you on the spot. He was doing this off Mexico. There were three whales in front of them, of him. One of them was prime suspect, the whale that breached onto me and Charlotte. He was able to put a GPS tag onto it. And this is the path that the whale that leapt onto us has been taking over the past couple of months. It, the tag came off on the 7th of February. The graph on the right shows the most up-to-date telemetry. Um, that's incredible. I mean, uh, he was also able to get a bit of, bit of sloughed off skin and they're going to run DNA analysis, analysis. So we'll know it's sex, but we'll also know other things like it's, it's hereditary information and how it fits into the gene pool of the humpbacks. And I think Happy Whale, uh, in, the, in the time since it launched, when that whale jumped onto us and today, has pretty much identified all the adult humpback whales in the North Pacific. I hope I've got that right on the, on the US side, um, which is something that would have been impossible if uh, just a couple of decades ago without these tools. Um, so in that sort of strange, and I remember when the whale first jumped onto me, Joy Reidenberg said to me, when I said, why did it breach onto us? She said, well, the problem is you can't just ask a whale. And I would now add to that, in the few years since then, it's become a lot easier to ask a whale. Firstly, you can find your whale. And secondly, we're developing these tools that might help you understand what they're saying to each other. Um, uh, why does this matter? Um, because, excuse me, I've got a bit of a sore throat, and I've been rabbiting on for ages. On the left, this is a picture of uh, of a flower seen through human eyes and seen in UV through the eyes of an insect. It is totally different. The other animals in the world perceive a different world from the one that we perceive. Um, they see things and hear things that we don't. Um, what could we learn from them and their perceptions? Uh, the biologist Karen Backer had this beautiful phrase she used, which was um, from the study of prairie dogs by Konstantin who uh, discovered that the prairie dogs seem to describe humans differently, the human experiment as they approach them um, and seem to have different vocalizations for them, yet humans uh, just see the prairie dogs as these little ground things. She said that it seems that some other species can better describe the differences between us as than we can describe the differences between them. What could we learn from these other fellow travelers in life on earth? Uh, on the right there, in the center, these are hand paintings um, from one of the oldest sites. Uh, some of these hands might be those of Neanderthals. These are a different species of hominid that went extinct, that we lived alongside. They had bigger brains than us. They practiced medicine. They cared for their sick and their elderly. They ever, even did operations on them and reset bones. Um, they painted, they made clothes. They're gone. And with them is gone the chance of talking to, to another species that lives on this planet. I find it absurd that we're so obsessed with uh, life in, on Mars. There's nothing there. You can see from Earth, there's nothing there. You can see there's nothing on the moon. Why do we keep, keep going back there? Um, I would find it absurd that we spend so much money on telescopes. Obviously, the pictures are beautiful. Obviously, it's really important. 
but I don't see distant stars going extinct anytime soon. And I do see the only other potential, like highly functioning animals that we could have a communication with in the entire universe going extinct sometime soon. Um, why? I, I love the idea that we're looking for subatomic particles, but they ain't going extinct anytime soon either. Um, why can't we have a CERN for trying to understand the communication that's been happening around us since we evolved and that continues to this day, but that we might finish? Um, and on the right, there is a dolphin blowing some bubble rings just to say, maybe those conversations might be fun. Maybe they're, maybe they're better at having fun than we are. We could learn some really lovely things too, potentially, and surprising. Um, this I love is a cartoon by Full Sneeze um, about thinking about this question of intelligence from the perspective of uh, some Js, I think there. I'll give you a moment to read it. I love this cartoon because a phrase that came up a lot um, in conversation with a species project and other people was that these tools, these machine learning tools and these machines help us take off our human glasses. And it is fun to take off our human glasses and think about what the world might be like from the perspective of other species. Um, and this, this is a picture, this is of the Paris uh, Museum of Anatomy, uh, the Zoological Museum rather. It's a, uh, as you can see, and this is like the Natural History Museum in London. This is the whale room. It's pretty incredible, but it's just a room of dead stuff. And if you go in here, um, this is, in my mind, a representation of the past of biology, which is the study of bodies, because we've only recently, uh, until recently, just been able to study bodies. We could measure bodies, we could stuff them, we could uh, paint them, we could look at how they fitted together, and we could compare them to each other. And that's really, really important. But I'm more interested in what bodies do um, in communication, in interaction, in behavior. And we have until our lifetimes been unable to capture any of those things. And now we can. Now we live in the age of biology, of being able to capture the communications between other species, of watching what they do, of seeing the differences between individuals. And it makes me wonder what the biology museums of the future will be like. Will you go and just see a room full of big bodies or will you go and think, I want to go and experience the life of an emperor penguin or emperor penguin bee in Antarctica? Will children be running through saying, mummy, mummy, I want to go see the swarm dynamics of the starlings and see how they whirl around each other and see the patterns that the machines found within those movements and help us experience things that we can't experience of ourselves. Um, uh, this is a quote by Robert Burns, which I love. Oh, I'm not going to try and do it in a Scottish accent. Uh, oh, what some power the gift it give us to see ourselves as others see us. It would free many, it free many a blunder free us from many a blunder free us and foolish notion. We have many foolish notions and blunders, and I think it would be an incredible power to see ourselves as others see us. Um, and I think this is one of the things that we might learn potentially painfully if we understand the communications of other species. Um, I know that's been a lot. I have no idea how long I've been talking for. Oh, good. Okay. Only 45 minutes. Um, here's uh, a picture of a humpback whale. Um, uh, uh, just because it's really beautiful. And uh, oh, no, there's my social media in case you want to follow more ramblings. And that that's the talk. And I'll stop screen sharing now. Uh, Wow, Tom. <laughs> anyway, this is just so, um, so fantastic. So much uh, great information. So uh, we definitely have some questions. So let me, um, let me get right to them. Okay, so um, uh, Timothy, uh, recently, he attended uh, Dr. Fred Sharp's presentation on bubble rings and humpback communication at Whale Fest Monterey in recently, an unanswered question involved identifying the the error marks of a, of a whale conversation. I don't know if that's supposed to be ear or think earmarks of a whale conversation. Outside of cooperative fishing and ostensible mating calls, have you ever witnessed what we might call a semantic conversation between two whales? Well, I haven't witnessed anything uh, in terms of the semantic conversations between whales because I, I've just been, they've only started to record these data sets. So um, 
uh, I, a lot of biologists out there, and I think maybe even some people on this might have uh, potentially with like captive dolphins been able to uh, uh, record. Um, well, there's like a bunch of things like there are a lot of uh, uh, um, experiments done on captive dolphins when they were taught as that's languages or so communication systems were uh, using um, uh, symbols or touch screens or gestures um, where the uh, some of the dolphins seem to understand semantic relationships of placing the commands or symbols in different orders and those different orders changing the meaning of the the, um, the task that they were set. Um, so yeah, they do like with those particular bottlenose dolphins, they did uh, seem to understand the importance of semantics, uh, as well as um, that you could have individual uh, meaningless sounds that only had meaning when they were combined with each other, which is another function of human uh, feature of human languages. But in terms of what the uh, AI tools have found so far, I mean, they are just recording the data sets now, so they haven't done these analyses. But I spoke to Dave Gruber from Project SETI. Um, like a few weeks ago, and they are hoping to have an update this this summer about how things are going there. But he said the biggest problem is just getting the data out of the ocean. The biologists just can't wait. The, the computer scientists can't wait to start analyzing with their tools. So, so that's a very unsatisfying answer. Um, but um, uh, so we'll have not yet. Continue that, but um, yes, I'd love to. Yeah, maybe this is a related um, question. This is um, do orcas or maybe in generally, do orcas have names for each other like bottlenose dolphins do? I oh, Maybe um, some of us didn't know bottlenose dolphins actually have names for each other either. Maybe you can comment yeah, on that. Yeah. I, th I think, yeah, so so their um, uh, names is the human term, uh, like signature whistles is the term that the biologists use. Uh, they were first described, I think, in bottlenose dolphins. And the idea is that uh, when a dolphin is young, it develops a particular whistle, which is different from the other whistles that it uses and the ones that other dolphins in its community, its pod, use. And that um, it keeps this once it's set for its lifetime. Um, and it seems to act in the same way as a name. And it's very important to know who's around you. And it seems that bottlenose dolphins actually have, like uh, uh, Julie Andrews at the University of St. Andrews, sorry, uh, uh, Judy, uh, Judy at the University of St. Andrews, she has been looking into whether dolphins actually have names for their own social groups. Um, uh, these signature whistles are very interesting because I think in some in some instances, dolphins that were separated in captivity and kept apart for over a decade, when reunited, remembered each other's signature whistles and used them, and they used them when they saw each other. Um, uh, they, I think they've been found in like seven or eight other cetaceans. I, I, um, excuse me, I don't know. I did know, but I've learned so many things and I've forgotten almost all of them. Um, uh if, if if that's the case with uh with orcas uh but i think maybe sorry again unsatisfactory yeah. answer <laughs> to be researched um okay I'm sure yeah. somebody will write it in the chat uh let's see okay do uh whales uh bodies are how are they influenced by sound um and i i know you go into this in your book but then the question is is hearing also bodily sensation how are they influenced by sound and bodily I, sensation? And is hearing also um, a bodily sensation? So, oh well, I, I mean it. Um, well, I think they, well, they hear at least some species through their jaw. I guess that's bodily, but they yes. they can the the sound waves are conducted through um, uh, uh, channels filled with I think fat or waxy tissue up effectively into their different uh, uh like like hearing systems um they have i mean they have they're like us they're multimodal they have vision they have touch a lot of the tag data has shown that humpbacks and other species are actually very tactile and touch each other i think it's very difficult for us to even conceive of what it is like to listen as a whale does the uh, toothed whales obviously echolocate and they perceive their world through sound and there's an experiment that came out uh, some results a couple of weeks ago that showed that they could, when the echoes of the echolocation clips come back, they can actually understand, even though there's various waves coming back from various objects or things in there uh, around them. So it's very sophisticated what they can perceive using those echolocation um, re uh, receptions. But also they, they, I mean, like a blue whale can, it can vocalize over 500 miles. And a really interesting thing for me is, Blue whales were thought to be solitary, apart from when they had these big, uh, like kind of megapods and groupings. 
but if you could hear your friends 500 miles away, what would it take to feel alone? You know, um, we thought they were by themselves because they were swimming by themselves. And for us being by yourself is when you see yourself alone, but that's because we're visual. We want line of sight to feel around each other. But these whales, if they can hear each other over entire ocean basins, maybe they never feel alone. Um, maybe they're not solitary at all. Maybe our idea of solitariness is so shaped by our human ideas that we're really missing lots of socialness in other species. And I think they feel the waves of the sound coming from each other and they must hear their own, feel their own voices. It must be extraordinary. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, wow, what a fascinating thought, right? Because sound is so important to them. Um, you know, the the slides you had where you were, it was, I, I think you said it was Northern Chile and you had um, the whale movement with all the ship traffic. Um, some questions on that. Um, uh, one comment was, was the whale, it almost looked like the whale was avoiding the ship traffic. Um, and then maybe a corollary question um, is related to um, the you know, ship strikes have been so huge in mortality events. So, uh, you know, maybe you could comment a little bit more about that fa fascinating um, part of your talk. I think, yeah, well, ship strike is, is very horrible. If you don't know what it is, it's when it's like oceanic roadkill when a ship hits a whale. Um, uh, and it... Um, it has, it, it, there's a slight puzzle there, like why don't the whales avoid the ships? Why do they get hit by them? I remember discussing this with John Cannon Bikidis of Cascadia uh, Research Collective when we were out with him and Ari, Ari Friedlander and other biologists like Jeremy Goldbogen who were doing a big study of the whales of the California coast. Um, and they had similarly, they had GPS tags on whales and they saw them swimming and then you could hear that you could see the, the the location tags of vessels and the whales were coming really really close to the vessels so they weren't avoiding them um and i was talking to joy about this and Reidenberg, and she felt that really these sounds don't make sense i don't know if you've had the feeling if you have you been uh outside and you've heard like a like a like a, a military jet coming past and you've looked up in the sky to try and see where it is and it's not been there it's been somewhere else totally different because it's traveling so much faster than anything else you hear but its acoustic signature is lagging behind it and so different from anything else you'd hear you can't accurately gauge where that fighter plane is in the sky and she was saying that this is something similar she feels for the whales yeah they can hear sound of boat but gauging where that boat is how fast it's traveling and where it's going uh, enough to like go away from it might be very hard imagine like you're in like instead of a fighter jet it's like a train and it could be coming at you from any direction but you need to go up to breathe um that would explain why these whales still get hit by boats even when the boats are so loud and in terms of avoidance yeah they i think most cetaceans actively avoid um loud noises from vessels if they can gauge where they are but sadly there are loud noises from vessels of all different sizes almost in like in, in like not everywhere but like they are they don't really have places they can go to apart from maybe parts of antarctica where there aren't our boats and our vessel traffic and often we tend to drive along the shores which is where there's lots of food you know the big stretches of the open ocean don't necessarily have much for them to forage on so they they have to come into contact but there are other things where there are bottlenose dolphins off italy for instance that seem to have become totally um habituated to vessel noise and they they drive around they so they swim around behind right by the engines of some of these big fishing boats um is this really unpleasant for them um but they do it anyway because they get food or maybe they don't mind in the way that i live in hackney in london i'm just really used to the sound of uh, police sirens and things going around um i don't know but one really fascinating area of research happened during the anthropause which is the name given to when human activity slowed down during the covid19 pandemic and vessel traffic reduced and the seas were suddenly much quieter and that meant that people who study um, what whales do in the seas could have a baseline for how they acted when there weren't wasn't so much sound and some of the findings so far have been that cortisol levels that's the stress hormone went down so the whales were less stressed and some other findings with some whale populations seem to indicate that the kind of vocalizations they did were different were they having more complex communications when it was quieter and you could listen and hear nuance in the voices of each other um, than when they were in a background of large noises um, in the same way that if suddenly there was lots of interference on this call 
I would change the way I tried to communicate with you. I would talk in short sentences. I would say simple things in case you couldn't hear everything I was saying. Um, so, um, the, you know, th their behaviors seem totally related to the massive changes we make to their acoustic environment because the acoustic environment for them is so important. Yes. Um, and and hopefully there be, because of all of the, the there seems to be more and more a public outcry around you know ship strikes and uh, limiting um, shipping lanes and you know hopefully there'll be other improvements you know on that threat. Um, okay, this is um, a question from one of our uh, loyal community members, Bonnie. Um, is there concern about the parts of the robots that hang in the water? Uh, and entanglement. Oh, do you, uh, is that in relation to the project SETI's um, static hydrophone arrays? They have um, they have ones that are on big buoys on the surface that hang down with hydrophones at intervals. I think they are so big and heavy that they and and they're I think often anchored at the bottom that entanglement would be very unlikely. Uh, I think it tends entanglement tends to happen with um, where you've got like uh, like lighter things that you can tangle around you. I mean, I remember in Monterey, like one of the people I met told me that that humpbacks often play in the kelp and roll over it, and that in, in, on encountering an object in the water, they roll their body, and that's why with a big plastic um, rope, it's so dangerous for them because it just gets wrapped round and round. But I don't, I don't think there is that concern with the ones they're designing there because of their robustness and their inflexibility. Uh, yeah. And in terms of the um, uh, the wave gliders, I don't know, because they've got thinner uh, cables running down from their surface part to their underneath part. Um, uh, but I, I, I've not heard of, of, of one of those becoming entangled with a whale. Um, uh, but I mean, every object we put in the sea tends to do something we don't expect it to do. Yeah. Um, Okay, a um, couple questions related to um, the this really exciting SETI project and, um, you know, really trying to decipher um, and use the AI and, and uh, pattern recognition. A um, couple things, you, you mentioned that, you know, that the question of how long do we need to listen before we start a conversation? And, um, I, can you say more about the, the danger of that? And then the, the related question is um, indeed about the ethics of this new knowledge. Um, how do we keep humans from exploiting this potential for really communication for war and profit, et cetera? Yeah, those are two incredibly important questions. Um, uh, in answer to the first one, like how long should we keep listening? I think I think we should be having a kind of parallel process of both um, engaging anthropologists and sociologists and people who study um, uh, contacts between uh, human communities and looking at um, what we've learned from things going wrong in those processes um, uh, to guide an ethical framework for how we might decide to interact um, with other species. Um, I think we need to listen for a, a long enough that it reassures us that we aren't going to cause damage by that communication. But this is against the backdrop of us causing damage by loads of other things we're doing in the sea. This isn't a, an uncontacted tribe of whales that never experiences humans. They're in many of these, like some of these populations are going extinct, like North Atlantic right whales in real trouble. Um, so it's really hard. Like, do you just back off something because of an unknown potential harm while you're also unintentionally harming them all the time in the background anyway. And this could be a really helpful tool. It's really tricky. And that brings me to the answer to the second question, which I think is that I think that these decisions are not for the people who invent the technologies, just as like, I, like, I think a really interesting parallel in the UK was that when we were able to manipulate embryos and allow couples who couldn't conceive to uh, conceive by in vitro fertilization and make human embryos outside the human body viable and transfer them. Um, this also um, brought with it uh, opportunities for things that people were unhappy about. The manipulation of those embryos, the um, 
in time the genetic manipulation and human cloning. Um, the scientists who developed those tools were not equipped to decide how they should be used by society. They were technicians and they'd made tools. And I think the same, and so what happened in the UK was a philosopher was charged by the UK government to bring various experts and members of the public into a public inquiry while application of these technologies was halted so that everybody could be appraised of these new powers that we had and decisions could be made reasonably with public consent um, about what red lines we'd have and not cross. And um, I thought it was very interesting they chose a philosopher for that. And I feel that a similar approach as we enter this uh, age where we will uh, not only be able to perceive new patterns within nature, but use those patterns to manipulate nature. Obviously, there are military uses for these technologies. Um, uh, we have a bad track record of manipulating other species for military and national aims. Um, I think there should be a total red line. I think there should be an international organization that is judged uh, with getting consent for red lines we don't cross in terms of how we mess with the natural world and the communication systems within it. This should absolutely not be the domain of corporations. The, this knowledge should be open. It can't be owned or sold. Otherwise, um, the motivations for how it is used will be linked to growth and human profit which don't lend, tend for, towards good outcomes and open, honest practice. Um, and so, um, and, and so I, I, when I started writing this book, I, I thought, this is really exciting. I would like to explain it to everybody who doesn't think it's exciting yet. And I didn't realize how fast the field would change. It hasn't actually proved very hard to explain it to people. people because so many of us are experiencing the ways that AI is changing our human world. Like I'm a wildlife filmmaker, I went to buy a camera yesterday and it has an AI chip that tracks um, the faces and focuses for you. That was the key skill of a wildlife camera operator, being able to follow focus, watching a bird in flight, keeping it sharp. To film an interview, it can keep the interview subject's eyes in perfect focus, uh, even with like a really, really tiny depth of field. So there go focus pullers. Um, uh, it can automatically color correct. There go the graders. It can uh, transcribe interviews. There go transcribers. It can translate interviews. There go translators. Um, you know, uh, all of these jobs in my own industry and in many of our industries are being changed because we're just throwing these impressive tools at ourselves. And I think we need to be really cautious before we connect them to the natural world and start manipulating the things we discovered there. Um, but in order for that to happen, we have to take these tools really seriously. We have to understand them. Um, otherwise, only a few people will know about it and they will be the people developing those tools and they're not best equipped to decide how to use them. Um, but I, I think it's really easy for act to accidentally get wrapped up in evil, terrifying future visions of AI and human applications of machine like uh, deep learning and other forms of machine learning, which is a form, which is part of what is called AI, which is a changing definition. Like one AI person told me that, that like uh, AI was described as whatever we haven't managed to make so far. Um, and this is similar in some ways to uh, human language, like lang the definition of language keeps changing or consciousness. Um, uh, so I think, I think there's a difference between these kind of futuristic, like, uh, we're all going to be turned into paper clips by machine overlords that have self have some form of sentience and uh, the ability to improve themselves infinitely from the very specific uh, like pattern finding that we're getting help with to understand other species so we can help them. Because a really, I think, foolish thing to do would be like to say, this is also creepy, let's not do any of it because that's not going to happen. And then the good guys will back off. Um, and and then it, 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 I think things will happen anyway. Yeah, um, you. I have to say, you've certainly put a new light on AI for me with your um, discussion of um, just taking all that data, big data, if there's enough of it, and seeing patterns, and seeing patterns across different human languages that are similar. And for us to be able to do that with other animals, it will be. I mean, as you said. Um, taking off our human glasses. So here's a great last question. Is access to the book available to the public? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> great question. Yes, it's available in all good bookstores. Uh, it's in the US. Um, 
Uh, it's uh, on ebook. Uh, you can get it from your independent bookstores. You can order it or you can buy it on Amazon. If you do, please leave a review. That's really helpful. It's my first book and it's really helpful. Um, yeah. I particularly recommend listening to it on Audible because um, uh, we put loads of the bioacoustic recordings in the audiobook. Uh, it's very. It, it's a weird thing to write a book about listening to animal sounds uh, because you have to describe them. And, it, and it's, I think, really nice to be able to listen to that to the vocalizations of the various like cetacean and other species too and we put loads of whale song in there um and loads of like funny strange beautiful things we found along the way wow oh something ed yeah i do narrate it on audible yes so if you could bear listening to me that that's the only downside um <laughs> is it's me um, well love that british accent too but hey thank you so much um for giving us this um, personal tour, really, of uh, of your own journey. And it, it's just been fantastic and so much to think about. And uh, honestly, I can't imagine you're not going to have a sequel to this. As you, as you mentioned to me earlier, you said, you know, this story found you. And uh, you, uh, you're, uh, you're doing a great job at it. So I hope uh, that, that, you do do a, a sequel because it sounds like there's a whole lot more coming out and uh, we'd love to have you back um, in the future. Thank so. you very much, Susan. It's really, really, really a pleasure to join you. Um, yeah, especially such a, wh a, whale, a whale club of an audience as well. <laughs> Lovely. Exactly. All right. Well, I'm going to turn off the recording, and uh, but it will be um, on our site and um, I'll, I'll make sure you see it too, Tom. Thanks again. Enjoy Cheers. your Sunday night. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye.